This last study that we're going to consider is, uh, I think, in many ways, the, the most exciting of the day. Because it's wonderful prophecy of things that we are now witnessing and which will shortly come to pass. We'll get to that in due time. But in, in order to introduce this era in the history of God's people, we need to have a look at what conditions were like uh, in the times of Jeroboam II and Isaiah King of Judah, who were contemporary rulers. So let's take a first, uh, the, a first glance at a second Jeroboam. Jeroboam the second. We call him the militant restorer. Now he, of course, uh, <coughs> was in the dynasty of Jehu. His name means, as Jeroboam's name meant, the people will contend. He reigns for 41 years from 794 BC uh, as co-regent and then from 781 to 754 as sole ruler of the northern kingdom of Israel. He was the son of Jehoash. He's contemporary with Amaziah and Isaiah, kings of Judah. And he lived at a time of great prosperity. This is what we say about him uh, in the king's notes. The character of Jeroboam II. Scripture has preserved only the military exploits of Jeroboam as he completed the work of his father in recovering the territory lost to Syria during the reigns of Jehu and Jehoahaz. Jeroboam II was a brilliant warrior and creative builder, but an abysmal spiritual leader. And that's the account of 2 Kings 14 and verse 24. He did not realise the unusual length of his reign was only due to the faithfulness of Yahweh, who had promised Jehu four generations on the throne. 2 Kings 10 and verse 30, which was, of course, Jehu's reward for destroying the house of Ahab and of removing Baal worship from Israel. So this, this man Jeroboam comes along. He lives in a time of prosperity. He has had a lot of success, but it leads nowhere. He is not going to be in the kingdom of God, and many of his people will not be in the kingdom of God because he gave no attention whatsoever to spiritual things. It was different in the south, although it ends up tragically. <clears throat> he had unparalleled prosperity. So Jeroboam's military success only su succeeded in producing a period of peace and prosperity for Israel, which they used for materialistic and self-serving purposes. And it's Amos, of course, who vividly describes life in the time of Jeroboam as being characterised by licentiousness, drunkenness and oppression. And there's a series of passages in Amos which speak eloquently about that. The wealthy and unscrupulous prospered, while the king assiduously promoted idolatry at Bethel. And that's all in the account of the prophet Amos, which we're not going to have a look at in particular. Because having noted King Jeroboam II in a time of prosperity, we now look south. We look down to the kingdom of Judah. And here we find the accession of Uzziah, the son of Amaziah. Now this, uh, this Uzziah, of course, we call the leprous king because this is how he concluded his life. But that is not the story of the first 40 years or so of his reign. Isaiah's name means strength of Yah. He's also known in the, in the account, of course, as Azariah. Yah has helped. And he reigned for the length, second longest period of any king of Judah, 52 years. Manasseh exceeded him, of course, by three years, reigning for 55. 52 years is a long time. His age at accession was 16. He was probably a co-regent uh, with his father uh, for a period of time. He was 68 years at death. I'm not too far away from that actually. So <laughs> this man's destiny was sealed at, at 68. And it was a tragic story. His father Amaziah, of course, was also a faithless man. Started well, ended badly. His mother, Jekyllia, Yah will enable, it's a bit of a clue actually, because that's the story of the first probably 40 or more years of Uzziah's reign. Yahweh enabled him, massively enabled him, 
as we're going to see as we proceed. He was contemporary with Jeroboam II, with Zechariah, Jeroboam's son, Shalom. Uh, Zechariah, of course, was assassinated by Shalom, Menahem, uh, Pekaiah, and Pekah. Uh, there was just an absolute um, mass of kings who came to power in Israel in the north in its last few terrible years. Now, there are some very significant references about King Uzziah. I want you to notice just two of them, because we'll come to these in due time. The first one is Zechariah 14, verse 5. Now, you will know that that makes mention of the earthquake in the days of Uzziah. Now, that's very important. We're going to see how important that is in due time. And the second one is in Isaiah 6, verse 1, which begins with the words, In the year that King Uzziah died. So the times of Uzziah, like the times of, of uh, Jeroboam II in the north, were times of great prosperity. This divided kingdom enjoyed a period of peace like none that they had experienced before and afterwards. This was the time of prosperity and relative peace. Now we're going to have a look then at the life of this man. I want you to join me in 2 Chronicles 26, the record of the achievements of Uzziah, king of Judah. Now we're not going to spend time just sort of going through this, uh, meander through it. We're going to just summarise it, basically. I'm going to give you a summary of what he achieves. This is very important because of its relationship to what we have seen in our time. So we look at verses 2 and 3. He built Eloth, or Elath, his first work, after the king slept with his fathers. We're told in verse 3, He was 16 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 2 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. Let me read this in verse 4. He did that which was right in the sight of Yahweh, according to all that his father Amaziah did. That is, Amaziah, though he ended faithlessly, was actually a man of principle when he began. He observed the divine principles. He didn't take vengeance on the children of the murderers of his father, etc. So, yeah, there was there was principle about him. So there was also this sense of principle about King Isaiah. But there was more. Look at verse five. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah. Now, this is, of course, not to be confused with the Zechariah that we considered in our earlier session. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. Now, this is interesting language. Now the word there in the visions of God, that word visions is the, is the Hebrew word raya. It means to see. So let, let's read it literally. The word understanding has the idea of separating something mentally so it can be distinguished. And Rotherham translates that phrase in the visions of God as in the seeing of God. It's an accurate translation. Now of course that's what That's what Bible study is all about, isn't it? That's what education and the truth is all about. It's about actually seeing God. Now, you can't see him with your eyes, but you can see him with the eye of faith. And so what this man, Zechariah, did for Isaiah was to educate him in the divine ways so that he had sight by faith of God. Visions or the seeing of God. And then it says this, And as long as he sought Yahweh, Elohim made him to prosper. And that's that's how it works, isn't it? If you develop that seeing of God, if you come to understand your God, to know him as he reveals himself, and you serve him, guess what he does? As long as you seek him, he sends forth the angels. Elohim made him to prosper. That's what happens in our lives. It happened in the life of King Isaiah. The angels were sent forth to minister on behalf of those who would be heirs of salvation in that day and they are sent forth today. So there's a very important lesson there. And then we have this catalogue of achievements. An unbelievable record of achievement over probably about 40 years. In verse 6 he went forth. He took the initiative. He defeated the Philistines. Uh, And he subdued three of their cities in verse 6. In verse 7, he waged a successful campaign against the the Arabians and the Metanims. So he was a a conqueror. 
And we read in verse 7 that God helped him in that. In verse 8, he put the Ammonites to tribute and became famous in the land of Egypt. In verse 9, he fortified the walls and defences of Jerusalem against attack. In verse 10, he brought water to the dry wilderness and promoted agriculture. He was a man who loved husbandry or farming. In verses 11 to 13, he built a formidable army of 300,000 highly trained soldiers. In verse 14, he built an arsenal of effective weapons of defence. In verse 15, he invented and built cunning engines of war in Jerusalem. It's not a bad list, is it? In verse 15, he became internationally famous for his success. This is going on over decades, but it's an unbelievable list of accomplishment. So why? Why was he so prosperous? Why was he so successful? Well, here's your answer. You find at the end of verse 15 of 2 Chronicles 26. In that final sentence it says, And his name spread far and abroad, for he was marvellously helped till he was strong. Now that word marvellously there is the Hebrew word palah. It means to separate or to distinguish. In other words, it was peculiar help. It was, it was something that God, that God specifically did for this man. And there are four declarations of divine help in this record up to verse 15. As long as he sought Yahweh, we read in verse 5, Elohim made him to prosper. In verse 7 we read, And God helped him against the Philistines and others. In verse 3 we read, we read these words. Sorry, in verse 8 we read these words. For he showed exceeding great strength. You see verse 8? At the end of the verse, for he strengthened himself exceedingly. That's not a great translation. Rotherham's translation is on the screen. But he showed exceeding great strength. In other words, it's not his strength. It's because God helped him. And then the declaration of verse 15, for he was marvellously helped till he was strong. And it was that strength that was his undoing. Because... He became filled with pride. Now this is a very natural human uh, nature thing, isn't it? It's, it's the way human nature works. You can be marvellously helped, you become very powerful, very strong, very, very successful, but then begin to think, well, I've done it. This is about me. And that's what happened to King Isaiah. And he becomes the would-be Messiah. After 40 years of unmitigated success, the question that began to circle in his mind, he occupied his mind with this question, when Messiah cometh, shall he do greater works than this man, meaning himself? Will Messiah do greater works than I've accomplished over the last 40 years? And his answer was no. So that means I must be Messiah. Okay, I must be the Messiah. This is the reason why he enters into the temple to take over the role of the high priest. He's already king. He knows that Messiah is going to be a king priest. He knows that from Melchizedek. David understood that. Isaiah understood that. He knows that Messiah is going to be a king priest. He's king. He's had all his success. God has clearly blessed him. All he needs is the high priesthood. And he's right. He can be the Messiah. So you see, he makes that answer. No, Messiah's not going to achieve any more than me. Now he had, a, he had a second name. His second name was Azariah. Guess what the name of the high priest was at this time? Azariah. So it's simply a matter of shifting one Azariah out and installing another Azariah as the high priest. That was his aim. Okay? So there was a simple transition from one Azariah to another. So this man began to think that he could be the Messiah. Now you might say to me, that's a bit of a stretch. Just hold on. Give me time. I'll show you it's true. Okay? We'll demonstrate that it's true. I want to have a look at his presumption. I want to read verses 16 down to verse... Uh, 
19. You notice how verse 16 starts? But. Well that's, that's the problem, isn't it, life? But. All this success, but. Yeah, it's telling you that there's something changing here. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against Yahweh his God and went into the temple to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest went in after him with 80 priests supporting him that were valiant men, valiant for the truth that is. And they withstood Uzziah the king and said to him, It doesn't appertain unto you, Uzziah, to burn incense unto Yahweh, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron. Get out of here. For thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honour from Yahweh Elohim. Then Uzziah was wroth. He had a censer in his hand. He was going to offer incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy shot forth. That's how Rotherhand translates that phrase. The leprosy shot forth in his forehead. Now, of course, that talks, doesn't it, in our language, that talks about the corruption of his thinking. You got leprosy in the forehead. That was the worst kind of leprosy that you could ever have. And we read in the law in Leviticus 13 that if you had leprosy in the forehead, you were wholly, totally unclean. It's the worst form. You you corrupt your thinking... Alright? That's the worst form of leprosy. That's what it represents. So it shot forth in his forehead. And they thrust him out from thence. Yea, himself hasted also to go out, it says at the end of verse 20, because Yahweh had smitten him. So we want to just analyse this little record here of the pretension, the presumption of Isaiah. So what we have on the two sides of the screen, we've got pretension on one side and projection. You'll see what we're on about here. Josephus records that Isaiah entered the temple on a special feast day to offer incense on behalf of the nation. Of course he would have chosen a special day. He wouldn't have chosen any day. He would have chosen a, a special day. But you see, all of this is projecting to the real Messiah. This is the would-be Messiah, Isaiah, who thinks he's Messiah. It's all projecting to the real Messiah. Christ offered himself and spotted to God at Passover, that very special day, on behalf of all mankind. Josephus says he threatened the priest with death. Christ was crucified by the demand of the priests. Josephus records that an earthquake split the temple, admitting a ray of light that illuminated Isaiah's leprous forehead. Now that might be an embellishment. But we do know there was an earthquake in the days of Isaiah. All right? So it's more than likely that this is the day of the earthquake in the days of Isaiah. An earthquake accompanied the splitting of the veil of the temple when Christ died. And the way into the most holy was open for him. We're going to see, of course, the opposite happens. Isaiah wants to become the high priest. He wants to go into the most holy. Well, no, he's got to go the other way, out the door. So you see how this is projecting to the real Messiah. Isaiah was smitten with leprosy, that is a living death, for the rest of his days. Graves were opened at Christ's death and he himself, three days later, arose to everlasting life. And we have this sharp contrast made between Isaiah and Christ. Isaiah the leper on the one hand, Christ the healer on the other. Isaiah the king was a leper unto the day of his death, says the record, because of an act of betrayal. At the moment of his betrayal, when Judas turns up, okay, at the moment of his betrayal, the king of the Jews healed a man called Malchus, whose name just happens to mean the king. Isaiah's selfish claim to the high priesthood was repudiated by infliction with leprosy. Christ's claim to the high priesthood was demonstrated by his compassion to those who were out of the way. Isaiah the leper dwelt in a house apart so he could not touch anyone and defile them. Christ, the healer, 
regularly touch the unclean, including lepers, to heal them. Isaiah the leper was never healed of leprosy, so he never had the priest touch his right ear with the blood of the sacrifice for the cleansing of the leper. Go back to Leviticus 14 verse 14. If you were cleansed of leprosy, which of course was non-existent, except in the case of Naaman, didn't happen. But if you were cleansed, you had to go to the priest. That's why Christ sent the lepers that he cured. He said, you go to the priest and show him what's happened. Because it's never happened before. They've never seen it. Go and show them. And they'll realise that there's someone here quite different than the law. Above the law. Christ touched the right ear of Malchus, whose name means the king, and healed him, thus signifying his power to cure the problem of leprosy. So you see these, these contrasts that are made. Comparisons and contrasts that are made. Isaiah the leprous king was lying in state for an obscure burial in the field of burial of the lesser kings. Christ as king and high priest is seen in Isaiah chapter 6 while Isaiah is waiting for burial. Christ is seen in glory. Now we know that from John chapter 12 verses 20, 39 to 41. That's pretty familiar but I think maybe we should look it up now. We should look it up now. John chapter 12. So in Isaiah 6 we have a vision. We'll come to that in more detail in our next study, God willing. But let's just see what that vision is all about. John chapter 12. In verse 39, we read this. Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, and he quotes from Isaiah 6 verse 10, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. So there is Isaiah 6 verse 10. These things said Isaiah, when he saw his... Christ's glory and spake of him. So when Isaiah 6 opens with the words in the year that King Isaiah died I saw Yahweh sitting upon a throne and his priestly garment filled the temple you've got a vision of Christ in glory as a king he's on a throne priest has a priestly garment okay that's the wonder of Isaiah chapter 6. Now we're going to go and explore that later on. I want to just focus now on Isaiah and who he represents. So death claims the son of David, Isaiah, dismissed from the throne and rejected from the priesthood which he had presumptuously sought. While Christ appears in glory in the vision of Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 to 3 with his glorified saints, the seraphim of that place, picked up in the language of Revelation 4 as we will see, who are kings and priests with him and who share his throne. What a story that is. Isaiah denied access to any court of God's house, but what did the seraphim cry in Isaiah 6? Holy, holy, holy. They've got access to the three courts of the house of Yahweh. The leprous king is buried without apparent hope, but Isaiah, as we will see, a little later on, is cured of his leprosy, his spiritual leprosy, by personal identification with the multitudinous Christ. Now, as I said, that's going to be filled out a little later. So, if Isaiah, who sought to be the Messiah, is not the true Messiah, of whom, therefore, is he a type? Modern Israel. Now, you saw the catalogue of his achievements, didn't you? Let's go through the achievements of modern Israel. And guess what? They're identical. They're identical to the achievements of King Uzziah of Judah. And basically in the same order. So let's go through them. He captured and built Elath as a trade city. That's what the Jews did very early in their history. Remember the 1956 Sinai campaign? And then the 1967 Six-Day War. Yeah. 
captured the Shephelah and the Negev. That's what Israel's done in its history. Defeats the Arabs and Jordanians in battle. Yeah, that's what they've done several times. 56, 67, 73, and so on. Fortifies Jerusalem against attack. That's what they've done. You know, in the 1960s, you couldn't build a new building in Jerusalem without making it proof against nuclear weapons. They had to be able to withstand nuclear weapons. Yeah. He builds a prosperous agricultural society. Yeah, I know, even in this continent, you eat oranges from Israel, don't you? They've made the desert. The blossom is the rose. They brought water out there. What did Isaiah do? Well, he provided water supplies for the desert, just like Israel has done, and produced amazing things. Isaiah had an army, of a powerful army of 300,000. You know when Israel goes to war, they don't have a standing army as such. You do your military service. They haven't got what they call a standing army. It's very small. When they go to war, you know what the size of Israel's army is? 300,000. Same number as Isaiah's. He became a leader in missile warfare. When Israel took delivery of American warplanes in the 1970s and subsequently they take off the American rockets and weapons and put on their own because they're superior. They are the leaders. Very much the leaders of technology in the world today. He was helped by God. No doubt about that. We were told that as Israel in the modern era, been helped by God? Well, of course they have. You can't survive an attack by 111 million people when you've got 3 million, as they had in 1967. We know they were helped by God. But sadly, like Isaiah, they attribute their success to their own strength. And you know that Israel claims to be the Messiah today? Can that be true? It is true. Let me give you the proof. This quotation from Barbara Tuchman, who was a Jewish historian. She died in 2004. She wrote a book called The Bible and Sword. Anybody in the room read Bible and Sword? You need to get it. It's about the role of Britain in relation to the return of the Jews to the land over two or three centuries. It is a very, very good book. Bible and Sword, Barbara Tuchman. This is what she wrote in that book. Not until they came to perceive, beginning in the 1860s, that they would have to act as their own Messiah did the return to Israel actually become realisable. Now that's supported by the writings of Heinrich Graetz, who wrote in 1864 these words. He was a historian. He said the Jewish people must be their own Messiah. That sounds weird, doesn't it? But they believe that they are the Messiah, the modern nation. Now when a party of of, uh, Christadelphians went to the land, including my uncle John Martin, they they met the chief rabbi of Jerusalem at the time, Rabbi Abrahams. And they asked him a simple question. Are you in expectation of the Messiah? His answer was, he's a rabbi. His answer was, we are the Messiah the nation is the Messiah yeah which is why we have the prophecies that we do about latter day Israel their pride and their arrogance which would characterise them to the very last day when Christ arrives on the Mount of Olives with the saints that's what will characterise them we know that from Ezekiel 39 pride and arrogance So he's helped by God and like Israel he attributed his success to himself, to his own strength. He wanted to be the Messiah and Israel today claims to be the Messiah. So what does God do about that? He humbles Isaiah probably with an earthquake at that time. And that's what he's going to do to Israel in the land. You come to Zechariah 14 verse 5. We 
know the story pretty well, don't we? Then shall Yahweh go forth, verse 3, and fight against those nations as when he fought on the day of battle. For reference back to Joshua chapter 10. Verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and it will cleave in the midst. Half goes towards the north and half toward the south. Verse 5. And ye shall flee from, as it should read, ye shall flee from the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach very near, as that should be rendered. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Yeah, because the modern nation of Israel thinks they are the Messiah. So how are they going to be humbled? Just like Uzziah was. Yeah, with an earthquake. Like it was, as it was in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And Yahweh my God, Christ and the saints, shall come, all the saints with him. Okay, so this is the record, we know it very well. So what's their problem? What's modern Israel's problem? Yeah, leprosy. So what, what do we read about Uzziah? He dwelt in, in the AV, it says he dwelt in a several house. You know what the word is in the Hebrew? It means a part. He dwelt in a house apart. Have a look at Zechariah chapter 12, verses 12 to 14. This is what happens to the remnant, the one third who survive. What do they do? Verse 12 of Zechariah 12. And the land shall mourn every family apart. The family of the house of David apart. Their wives apart. The family of the house of Nathan apart. And their wives apart. Guess how many times the word apart in the Hebrew occurs? Eleven. The number of failure. So just like Isaiah, they're dwelling in houses apart because they're leprous in their thinking. So how do you cure people of leprosy? Well, Zechariah 13 verse 1 tells us what's going to happen to these people who in their dwelling in houses apart repent and realise the folly of what they've done and what their fathers have done in killing their own Messiah. And we read in Zechariah 13 verse 1, In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. You know what that word uncleanness is in the Hebrew? It's the Hebrew word nidah. It means rejection. And you find that this is the principle of Leviticus 14 verse 8. You're declared leprous, you're rejected, you're put out. So this is about cleansing people from leprosy. Yeah. So that's why Isaiah is a marvellous type of modern Israel. Israel's king priest will ultimately come, but it wasn't Isaiah, was it? Israel of the modern time is not the Messiah. Hosea 3 verses 4 and 5 tells us about the real Messiah. It tells us that the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, without an image, and without an ephod, without teraphim. So there's no king and there's no priest. Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek Yahweh their God, and David their king, namely the Lord Jesus Christ, and shall fear Yahweh and his goodness in the latter days. And you and I hope to be there, not only to see it, but to be involved in the work of the redemption of that people. To cure modern Israel. And among those who will be there in that host of the four living creatures and the 24 elders which speak eloquently of the king priestly role of the saints in the future age will be people like Jehoiada, Jehoshabath, Zechariah the son of Jehoiada, Isaiah the prophet cured of his leprosy as we'll see in Isaiah 6, he'll be there. But we want to be there too, don't we? And we want to sing those words that thou hast made us unto our God, kings and priests. We don't have to be presumptuous, do we? we just got to be dedicated and faithful and loyal because we want to be part of this vision in the year that King Isaiah died read that this way in the year that arrogant 
modern Israel that claims to be the Messiah, as it were, dies and a remnant is saved out of them and cured of leprosy. This is what they will see and this is what we will be involved in. I saw also Yahweh, as it should read, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. That word train, of course, has to do with priestly garments. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. You know, that's a curious thing, isn't it? How many wings do the cherubim in Ezekiel chapter 1 have? Four. The seraphim of Isaiah 6 have six how many seraphim, how many cherubim are there? Four. Four times six is twenty-four. The twenty-four elders, which is based upon Chronicles, First Chronicles 24 and 25, where David organised the Levites and the priests into twenty-four courses. Twenty-four is the number of the priests. Six wings, with twain, with two he covered his feet, uh, his face, his feet, and with two did he fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. We're going to talk a little bit about Isaiah, uh, in Isaiah chapter 6 in our next study, God willing. But isn't that a marvellous prophecy? Isn't that just incredible, the way that we can see how in the failure of King Isaiah, God can actually lay down the pattern for events that you and I are witnessing right now and which we're shortly going to be involved in. What a wonderful thing that is as we go to our bed of rest tonight. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's Milestone Snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's Weekly World Watch and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by Christadelphianvideo.org. 
Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation. So please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.